We got a minute, so let's get settled. If you want to move up front, be more. There's a couple seats. All right. Should we get started on time? All right. So before I start, how many people are in the game industry? Just so I know, raise a hand. Okay. How many are hobbyists? Hobbyist. Okay. How many wanna be? Okay. Good. All right. That will help me with the presentation. I'll design it for you guys then. So. This is kind of everything you wanted to know about the gaming industry, but we're afraid to ask in the time that we have, which is roughly 45 minutes. Um, let's get a couple things out of the way. I get this asked every day, you know, do you play games for a living? The long answer is no. What I really do is make complex software, working with developers, artists, creative people, designers, analytics, working on complex interactive software programs, usually on specific hardware. Each of the specific, specific hardware devices have their own quirks. They have their own testing that they need to be done. Usually there's multiplayer experience. Um, we have very strict deadlines. We have to get this done. And by the way, it has to be fun. So everyone, it's really easy to make software, but you also have to make it fun. So the short answer is yes, I do play games most of the day, but um, we'll get a little bit. Uh, some other things. Um, this is not an inter this is an interactive talk. This is not a lecture. If you have a question, ask it. That's why we're here. This is the unconference. Let's ask questions. I also schedule time for, for questions afterwards. Um, if you're shy and you don't like to ask questions in front of people, I understand that. Send me an email. Send me a tweet. I'm more than happy to talk to you. Um, I do have a session right after this, so I have to run to that. But I will be here afterwards or, hey, you know, Grab a beer or whatever. So, you know, silence your phones, your watches, your goggles, whatever you have. Call your mom. She misses you. Um, this is all the places I worked at. Um, this doesn't mean I'm cool. Just, this just means I'm old. Um, a lot of people ask, they say, Chip, your logo's wrong. Nope, that's actually the, what the logo looked like in the, when I started working there in the late 80s. So I've been in the tech industry for 26 years. Uh, 20 of those years in video games. Um, I've shipped over 100 titles. I manage small teams, big teams, locally, virtually, multi-time zones. I think my record is seven different time zones, 10 teams at once. Um, if you're on Xbox or other places, you'll if you see Bad Apple, that's my gamer tag. Also, sometimes my son steals it, um, so be careful. Uh, here's I made this an eye chart on purpose because some of the games I'm not that proud about, but I have shipped over 100 titles. Um, and it's taken me all over the world, which has been incredible. So the green, if you can see this, the green dots are actually where I actually lived and made games for a living. The red ones is where I spent time actually in those places, sometimes months, working on games to get them out. And the blues are places that I've worked with, but I haven't got to visit yet, which I'm really depressed because I really want to get to New Zealand and Australia and China, all those places. So I have to have a disclaimer. Um, you know, not everyone experience is the same in games. This just, you know, happens to be mine. Uh, there's roles, there's titles at different companies that could be completely different at another company. So EA has producers, but they do different things or they have development directors that are kind of like executive producers. So you know, roll with this. Um, every studio has their good points and they have their bad points and they all have their different cultures and they're, they're all different. And so this is my story and mostly I've changed the name to Protect the Guilty. Um, so this is a three-part talk, working in the game industry, some of the different roles, so those people who want to get into game industry, you don't just have to code. We're going to talk about those. Questions, that's actually the most important part of the three. Uh, but before we begin, I need to show you this video. Some of you may have seen it. Hopefully there's audio. And there's no audio. Great. So what these guys are doing, they're saying, hey, the boss is coming. And she's like, hey, I need you to design those two games really quick. And he's like, OK, we're just tightening up the graphics on level three and we'll be done. Now he goes, hey, my mom never thought I'd get a job. 
me either. Making games is great. This. <laughs> There's so many things wrong with that video. Please look it up on the, on the internet. Um, that company has been sued and is now out of business uh, because you cannot, that's not how you make games. Um, they actually were using controllers. That's, you can play games on controllers, but you don't develop games on controllers. You don't design games on controllers. Um, they also were playing on a, on a, they weren't even showing what they're playing on. Uh, you needed either a computer or a dev kit and everything. So they did a really bad, great job of selling kids to go to their school. And when they came out, they had no skills at all. So be very careful of where you sit, go to school, look up on them, read about them. Because uh, there's a lot of people who want to take your money. So uh, the game industry, to be honest, it's not for everyone. Question. There, that's, see, those are different. You know, if, if you're going to a major university and they have a master's program, they usually are good. I'm talking about these fly-by-night schools, um, and I don't, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but ITT had one that was kind of eh. And uh, so a lot of these big schools that have really, truly are accredited universities um, and have master's programs, yeah, they're good. <laughs> I'm talking about mostly these two people who you advertise late Saturday night. Those are the ones you want to watch out for. Um, what a lot of people don't know about games is it's really hard. It's hard to make games. Um, it's hard not only to make a game, it's even harder to make a fun game, and it's even harder to make a fun game that makes money. And that's what a lot of people are dealing with right now with uh, the indie, what's going on. It's very competitive. There's 600 new games a day that come out just on iOS. Um, so it's competitive. And a lot of things that people forget is it's a business. It's about making money at the end of the day. I hate to say that, but it's true. So you have to, you know, Best Buy here, let's just save. Let's say you guys all worked for me and this was my studio. And you all had com nice computers on your desks and everything. So we need to make money to make sure everyone has a payroll, have everyone have a paycheck Friday, keep the lights on, power all your computers, all the software on your computers legally. Um, um, all the licenses. Um, and insurance, rent. So you have to make money at the end of the day um, to keep your studio going and to make money. And, but it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, but it's also the most rewarding thing I've ever done. And I don't want to change it, and that's why I'm still doing it. So I also, I talk to a lot of people, and I know we have a lot of indie developers here, and that's great, because by day, I am the uh, studio director at Concrete Software, but night, I'm Batman. No, um, actually I have uh, Frostbit Studio, which is my own, which I'm trying to make my own games. But a lot of people always go, no, Chip, I want to work on AAA games. I don't want to work on indie games. and I, I want to work on something big. So I was lucky. I had the, one of my first opportunities was to work on Xbox, the original Xbox. Um, and I did the first hockey game. And which was great, being a person from Minnesota, to be able to work on a hockey game. And I would say this is a AAA title. We spent $5 million just for the license for the NHL. We had 60-person team for two years to get it out. And then I moved, came back to, um, came back to Minnesota, Activision, and I worked on Cabela's Hunts. And a lot of people were like, you work on hunting games and fishing games? And I'm like, yeah, you know? Every game is a problem. It's a software problem. You have to design problems. At the end of the day, it's all about solving problems. And, and try designing a hunting game. It's hard, but it's also fun. But here's the difference. That one sold 65,000 units, if you can see that from the back. That did not pay for itself. Just the Wii version sold over a million units and brought in about $50 million. So, um, yes, it's fun to work on AAA games, but also licensed properties, you, you never know what's going to make money. You know, I worked on Barbie, I worked on Hot Wheels, Dancing with the Stars. It made money. 
you know, but also at the same time, it was very challenging for me and to get a team to put together and say, let's make something fun out of this. And still had to, we still had to do it. So a question that always comes up is like, what's the difference between a developer and a publisher? So we'll break this down. So usually as the developer, I call it, that's where the magic happens. So that's usually where the people are actually, this is old school and we'll bring it into the modern times now. But you know, when I was working for Microsoft and working for Activision, the developers were the external companies that we worked with and they were the ones doing the code, doing the design, doing the art. So that's why I always say that's where the magic happened. And if you remember all those dots in the, <laughs> on the map, I love to go work with them because that's where the magic happened. Cons though is the publisher can cancel that game. If you're working on a game for two years, publisher can say, I don't like it, um, we're done, you're out of luck. And so suddenly you have to scramble for another project. Because a lot of times these developers are living off of what we call milestones. So if you deliver a piece of code at the end of the month, they give you a check. It's kind of like allowance, um, but you have to do the work. And sometimes developers are late. You know, your parents sometimes were late with your allowance. Well, how about when you have checks for twenty, thirty thousand dollars and you have to pay your people? That can be really difficult. So it's kind of scary um, when you're working for a developer and your publisher doesn't pay. Publisher, sometimes they have developers inside. Sometimes they work without. Um, you can work on several projects at once is good. I worked at a publisher, so also the con was you could work on several projects at once. Um, so a lot of times you're juggling these projects internally, externally, sometimes 10 projects I had at one time that I was working on trying to get out. Um, so a lot of stuff going on. The environment has really changed now from what a publisher is. A publisher used to really be the gatekeepers. Before, if you wanted to get on Xbox, if you wanted to get on Nintendo, if you wanted to get on Sony, you really needed a publisher because they had the license to develop games for those consoles. And those development kits usually are $10,000, $5,000. So once again, if this group right here is my developers, how much is that, <laughs> and they all need dev kits, that's a lot of money just to get going. So what publishers usually do is they loan you the kits that you can do, or they'll say, we'll take it out of your royalties. And then by the end of the day, you may not, once again, have any money. So, what was your question again? How did you manage so many projects at once? The question was, how did I manage so many projects at once? Um, speed, uh, caffeine. Um, it's, uh, I, you had to juggle. You had to put priority what was in level. I tried to set up each day which game I'm gonna work with set up your milestones, try to balance them off of each other. I would get other people, I would have somebody in test maybe that would work with me and i say, hey, you wanna be a producer someday? You, you know, you communicate with the developer. Um, so it was a lot of juggling going on back and forth, but it was a lot of hours. I mean, during crunch time, which we'll get to, you know, 70, 100 hour weeks was normal to get those games out. When, I was a pure producer when I was, um, I usually had four, four or five. When I became a studio manager, um, when I first started at Activision um, Minneapolis, also known as Activision Minneapolis Licensed Business Unit, uh, when I first started, we shipped 12 games a year. Four years later, we shipped 100 SKUs in one year. And then I quit. Because <laughs> I wanted to see my oldest son senior year. Um, so yeah, it can get crazy. So publisher, developer, I talked a little bit about it. Yes, maybe there's more security. So let, let's say, I'll give you a real life example. So developer, Call of Duty, used to be on their own. They made so much money, did so well, they got purchased. And now they're a developer inside of Activision Blizzard. Okay, so there's a little bit more security for them because they now are gonna have, they're inside the studio, they really don't have to worry about milestones anymore, they have to worry about making good games still that sell. Um, but sometimes inside those studios can get absorbed. So most recently, 
Remember the Tony Hawk games? How cool those were? Neversoft was an awesome developer. They got, f are you from Neversoft? Okay, thank you. Yeah, great bunch of people. They got absorbed into the Call of Duty team. So Neversoft is no more. They just got absorbed into the Borg of Call of Duty, which is kind of sad, but some quit, some stayed. Um, the cons is you, you, you get golden handcuffs. Is you're, you know, when you're working on Tony Hawk, you're working at Call of Duty, it's really hard to leave because it's like, if I stay, I'm making money, I can get a bonus, I don't wanna leave. And you get used to it, so you have these golden handcuffs. Um, the really sad side is that they can buy you and then shut you down. Um, once again, I'm gonna pick on Activision, but they purchased, um, somebody helped me, they were a great racing game studio out of the UK. They did Gotham, they did, um, I'm sorry, they were an independent developer for 20 years. They got bought by Activision and it was like, oh great, they're gonna make more games. I think three years later they shut them down. Ugh, you know, very sad, very sad. So that, that happens and that's what's going on right now. There's a lot of studios going up and down. Um, so let's have a moment of silence for those great studios. Um, but you know, Chip, what's it really like? Well, your experience will vary depending on what company you work for, how big the company is, how small it is, where it's located. Um, I'll break it down so it's really, really simple. This is how I like to look at it. Big studios, you get free pop. When I worked at Microsoft, it was awesome. I got free pop every day. Um, the one funny story I used to have was, since I came from Minnesota to out to work in Seattle, um, I never adjusted to the time zone, so I was always there by seven. But most of the Microsoft people didn't come in until 10. Um, so the first question my marketing manager would ask me was how many Cokes I had at 10 o'clock when she came in. If it was two, she would talk to me. If I said six, she wouldn't. Because um, <laughs> that means something went wrong. And I was also working with a game with a, with a group in Toronto, so they were also two hours ahead. So. We got in roughly the same time. But free pop, my kids love it too. Not only free pop, free chocolate milk. So they came on the weekends. Small studio like I am now, I go to Costco and I buy the pop and bring it in and we share it, we split the costs. Um, and my favorite in these studios, you steal it. <laughs> Any way you can, you get that, you need that caffeine. So you need to you usually steal it. Um, and that kind of how it breaks down. It's just kind of like, at big studios, there's a lot of perks that keep you there. Um, I was at GDC, does everybody know what GDC is? Game Developer Conference? I never heard this term before, but it's so perfect. They were talking about, I went to a speech on designing a studio, how to design your studio to get the most from your people as far as do you want to open design, offices. And they were talking about Facebook, Google, they described them as fun prisons. Because <laughs> they, they never want their people to leave. So they have free food, they have you know, showers and workrooms. They just don't want you to leave. It's a fun prison, perfect world. So smaller studios, once again, maybe not all the perks, but you maybe get to do more things, different things, have more input. And then indie studios, um, indie means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but you know, usually indie, it could be a group of people together, a group of virtual people together, working together. You can decide your course of where you want to go. But a lot of times you're bootstrapping it, so you need to steal pop. First, okay, let's take a time out here. Is this, everyone, can you hear me? Good information? Okay, any good questions? Any questions right before we get into some stuff? Correct. Oh, did you say developer? I am not a developer. <laughs> I've done Hello World and so many programs. Um, actually, I'm learning the program now. Um, and actually, I'm gonna go through the different roles and I'll talk about those. But professionally, I've been a producer. At night, now I'm coding, which I'm having more fun now. So you can still do it. You don't have to be a kid anymore. You can still learn stuff. Um, any other questions? Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the product cycle about how a game gets built. 
And once again, this is a little old school, and I'm going to talk about new school. But pre-production. Um, you hope you have pre-production. Um, I've been at studios where I had pre-production for a year, and I spent a million dollars on a prototype. It was awesome. Um, I've had pre-production for three days on a game. Um, I've had no pre-production. Rawson, right? Um, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know Rawson, Rawson is a game designer for 20 years, also known as the Vid Kid. Look him up on Google when he was on Johnny Carson. I always like to make fun of Rawson. Rawson and I work together. But we just f survived a project where we had no pre-production. I hired him and I said, guess what? St design this game, go. Um, but traditionally, you want pre-production, and that's where you're establishing what are your design pillars, what are your play mechanics. You have your design docs written out and created. You have a prototype built. You can see what, it's lo what it looks like, what you can do, and then somebody green lights it, and you say, yes, we're moving forward with it. So you can do that in many different ways. Right now, we're doing it, this, actually finishing it up right now for two projects, and this is exactly what we're doing. We're figuring out what our design principles are. We know, what are we holding high? Where when we finish this game, it's going to be X. And then what are the play mechanics? What are the basic play mechanics that we're building off of? And then we want to have the design docs, create it. And because we're working with a partner, so we're working with a licensed partner. And we want to be able to show them at the end, this is what you're going to get. And they have to say yes or no on it. We have a great prototypes because we're using Agile. Once again, something Ross has introduced to our company. So every two weeks, we're constantly building something new. And we we're iterating on it. So we we're seeing it very much real time. So way go back in the time machine, back with me when I was working on hockey, we, did <laughs> we didn't, sorry, we didn't, we didn't use Agile. And so it'd be months sometimes before we would see something. And it was like two months into it, and like, this is not fun. Right now, we're seeing, this is fun. Keep it going. Oh, that's not fun. Take it out. That's not fun to take it out. So um, I really suggest looking up Agile Scrum process. Um, once you get your pre-production done, you actually move into production. And what I like to say is this is kind of like when you turn on the assembly line and you actually start making things. So I'll give you a real, uh, let's use that hockey game, for example. So during pre-production, we figured out what our characters were going to look like, how the models were going to be built, how many polygons they had, how big a textures they were going to have, what are the textures going to look like, how are we going to apply the textures on them, how the AI was going to work, how many teams were we going to have, how many stadiums we had. All that worked out, and then <coughs> we put it into gear, and everybody started to build the different hockey players and all the different jerseys and all the different stadiums. So we built one, now we're like, okay, repeat it. And so that's chug, 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 build all those things out. And hopefully, you don't run into problems, but you always do. You got to fix them, figure out those problems. And usually production comes to the end, which, which we call alpha. And uh, we like to call it code complete. That means that all the features in a perfect world, all the features are coded and nothing left is bugs. So you're not adding any more features into the game. Everything should be coded at that part. Next, we move into post-production the beta phase, and this is where we get to a point where it's usually art complete. And so there's still bugs in the game. Still bugs in the game. Thank you, Microsoft. And using, I'm using Mac 16, OS 16, so. This is a great time for questions while I reboot this thing. Anybody have a question? Excuse me? Um, not in this session. But, uh, well, we could. Do you want to talk about it? Do you want to talk about IGDA and why uh, TC, why everyone should be going there while I reboot this?
I have no mic. Oh, thank, you. thank you for that brief um, local scene update. Back to the, the screen. Um, so after we get into what we call beta art complete, um, there's still a lot of bugs in the game. But we used to say if someone put a gun to your head, you could ship the game if you had to. Um, a lot, lot, lot of what's going on right now is you see a lot of these games coming out on Steam in beta, and they're asking you to test them. And what's even funnier is they're asking you to pay to test their games, which is, wow, that would have been awesome back when I was doing it. But So that's a new thing, but that's great. That's something with the internet that's allowing us to do it with mobile. It's allowing us to do it with PC. Um, but this is where we're really trying to put the final push on. And some of the reasons why we had to have these big stops is because of manufacturer testing. So back in the day when you had to actually submit a game to Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo, you didn't have to do it for PC. PC, you could just put it out if you want. But Sony has their own set of rules. Nintendo has their own set of rules. Microsoft has their own set of rules on what will pass in their system. Nintendo's really, really stresses saving. They don't want to destroy data, so they check that. Microsoft is really about gameplay. Um, Sony is a lot about not breaking their rules. So they all have their own different rules, and sometimes it can take three weeks, a month, to get your product tested, and you cannot go to manufacturing until they approve it. So you're trying to get this game done. So if we wanted a game out, by November, we had to submit it, usually August, July, we really wanted to. I've done September, I've done October, I pulled strings um, to get these things tested and submit it, because then they had to make a physical disc, they had to make a box. You had to, we were penalized, here's a great story, working with Best Buy here, if they had a sale on one of our games and it was not delivered by that time, they would fine us $10,000 so boom, 10,000 right off the bat. So now being able to deliver digitally is great. Um, a lot of times this is, helps. Um, so post ship, now there's updates. You know, with the Xbox, that was the first time they had DLC because they had an internet port on the back. Um, but you can do bug fixes, you know, especially with mobile, PC. You're getting updates all the time now, bug fixes, it's great. You know, but before it used to be unlocked on that disc, so you couldn't do anything. It was trapped. Um, but also at that time, we would get your $60 for that disc and buy. It didn't matter. Now we're, we're dealing with freemium. If they don't like your game, they delete it. All, we're still putting in all this time, all this effort. And if somebody doesn't like your game or they figure out a way where they don't have to buy anything, you're not making any money. So it's, it's a tough world. Because how, how do you often go through testing it? Do you have a set, set thing that you use to test it? Yes. Um, uh, different, there's many different groups. The question was asked, how do we test the game? Um, depending on where you're at, Microsoft had their own group of testers. Ooh, we're at time already? Holy smokes, I got to get going here. Um, so. Um, there's going to be internal testing, external testing. There's groups that just outsource your testing to Canada, to India, to China, whatever you want. I love it internal. Because if you have a bug, the developer or the tester can walk over to the developer and go, boom, and he can go, oh, or she can go, oh, and so on. So let's talk about a sensitive topic known as the crunch. Um, have everybody heard of the crunch? Has everybody heard of the the EA wife's email, okay? So uh, crunch is the final push to get the game out. Uh, it can last anywhere from one week, one month, to two years, depending on the project you're working on. Um, not uncommon to be working 70 to 80, 100 hours a week to get your game out once again, because you're trying to hit those deadlines. You're trying to, it really was hit Christmas, hit Christmas, or Black Friday, back when I was doing it. Um, you know, sleeping at work, I had a futon, uh, I had a change of clothes, I had a shower. It was a way of life. Um, not very happy about it. Personally, my record is 70 hours straight. 
um, right before Thanksgiving, came in on Monday, didn't come back until Thursday, did not really sit well with the wife and kids. When, you're, when they're calling you going, are you going to come home for Thanksgiving? Um, so I've never been on a project where there wasn't some sort of crunch at all. Um, they often start with, we're not going to have a crunch this year. <laughs> Almost. I might have said that myself. Um, the shortest crunch I ever had was when I ran my own studio because I didn't want a crunch. And really what comes down to crunch is poor planning, no vision, and feature creep. So if you don't know what you're building and you're just kind of building it, it's going to go on forever. No vision, once again, it's like, maybe we'll go over here. We want to be this. We want to be that. Feature creep. Um, this is where the producer really comes in. You have to have, excuse me, balls of steel. Um, or if you're a woman, you know, be tough. <laughs> Viral. I didn't hear what you said, but... And, and you have to stand up and say no. Um, I was working on a game. We were done. We were going into submission. We were all happy with September. And let's just say an executive came in and said, I just played this really cool game, and they have this cool feature when you get shot, and you have a second chance to shoot them while you're dying. I want it in our game. I'm like, we're done. He's like, I want it in. So we had to put it in, and then we got yelled at, why are you a month late? Why are you wrong? I'm like, I won't finish that sentence. So my suggestion is, if you're getting into games, especially if you're an indie developer, be realistic on what you can build and the amount of time you have, the people you have. Use Agile to actually build on top of it. See what's fun, get something out there. Cut early, cut often. If something's not working, cut it, get it out of there. Um, and be realistic to hit your dates. So talk a little about Agile Scrum. I talked a little bit about this already. Let's get moving. Da -da -da. Work environments. I worked in a lot of different work environments. Does anybody know what that place is? Yes, it is. That's, yep, that's Mojang before he left. That's in this one. Nope. Robio. OK. What about this one? Yeah, exactly. So don't get sucked in just because they have cool, a cool environment. These guys are probably kicking ass and creating cooler things. It doesn't matter at the end of the day because, once again, is it a fun prison? Are they just building stuff? You know, they have those ping pong tables and stuff, but if you're crunching and trying to get something out, do you think you're playing ping pong? No. You know? So, you know, don't be impressed with the flash. Don't get sucked into that. Who cares? You know, work from home. Work in your basement. Um, there's different styles, different offices, open environments, closed environments. I like open environments where everybody can work together. Um, virtual, you know, how many, has anybody played um, Alto, the adventure, the snowboarding game on iOS? Look it up, great game. Three guys built that, two years, never saw each other till GDC last month. First time we saw each other, excellent game. Um, you can also outsource a lot of your work, but um, don't, once again, my big thing is don't get sucked into the, the gaming, what it looks like, it's all the flash. Google Docs, Jira, um, Basecamp, um, what's another one with an S? Stack. Slack. Slack. Slack, GitHub, FaceTime, IM, all those things will help you. We use Google Doc. We use IM. We're all in the same building. So there's a paradigm shift happening right now. How many people see a rabbit? How many people see a bird? OK. So a lot of stuff going on right now in the game industry. Industry is changing. Rise of mobile. Rise of indie. PC is coming back. PC games are coming back. VR is coming back. Consoles in flux. Now the publishers need you. Before, they, didn't, they could take and leave you. Now they need you. They need your games on their platforms. They need hits. So what does this all mean? Opportunity. Opportunity. Yes, you why is PC gaming coming back? 
Um, I think people are getting kind of fed up with consoles. Or also, because there's so many cool indie games coming out that people want to play them on. You have a, I think you have a, you disagree? Why do you think they're coming back? No, PC. Right, so there is no right or wrong answer. You play what you want to play on. If you, I actually was a huge console PC gamer. Now I'm mostly always on mobile, but my kids are on console. But that's the thing is, before there was just like one of them. Now there's many, so you can actually, there's more opportunity. Um, end of part one, questions, different roles. Sorry, moving along. Um, <laughs> so usually it takes a village to create a game i like to say it actually takes a uh, idiot a village of idiots to really run a game so let's meet some of those idiots first testers we talked a little bit about this but this is the testers um they are the most underrated people in the gaming industry um it's entry level that's usually how a lot of people get their foot in the door into gaming um you know it's their job to test the game and it is a hard job because all day long they have to play with this game. And a lot of times I like to explain it is put the worst song on your headphones, the worst food you had to eat, and sit there and do that for 10 hours a day. Because it's not like you're playing a finished copy of Call of Duty. You're crashing every five minutes. You're, the graphics don't load. Maybe the, the big enemy boss is just a gray block moving towards you right now. So. It's tough. Um, I like to joke, I'm making fun of everyone. I'm gonna make fun of producers here too. A lot of testers always think they're designers, but some great testers become designers. Right, Rawson? Rawson started in the test. Um, as I said, the most underrated role, and there's many different kind of testers. There's gameplay testers, there's mul multiplayer testers, technical testers, and tool testers who actually build tools to help test the game. Producers, haha, -ha, me. Um, with Cracker Cheerleader, that's the best way of explaining it to people. What I do is I'm like, get to work, get that done. Yes, yes, <laughs> go, go. But it's, you know, I have to keep the vision. I have to be the, carry that banner. Um, you know, if somebody says, well, let's put this feature in the game, it's like, no. You know, convince me it should be in. Okay, what good, what's coming out? If you want to put that in, what's coming out? So it's our job, I always say, Ship the, the, the game on time, on schedule, and on budget. Fight feature creep. In many different flavors. System producers, associate producers, you can work your way up. Designers. I like to joke prima donnas, you know. It's the, but it's their job, at the end of the day, everything in that game, all those design mechanics, they have to come up with them. They have to figure them out. So there's, there's gameplay designers, but there's also visual game designers that have to come up with a look, what those characters look like, concept artists. It's their job. End of the day, they gotta make it fun. That's their job. It's hard. It's really hard. And so there's a lot. But that usually seems like everyone, I wanna be a game designer. It's hard. And the problem is, there's not a lot of them. And so that goes back to the one of the very first things I said where their schools are trying to sell you when you come out, you'll be a game designer. No, sorry. Um, it's not like accountant where you're going to accounting school. There's some entry level accountants. There's not a lot of entry design positions. And that's kind of why it's great to be an indie, an indie person. You can do it yourself. Artists, this is what I thought I was gonna be. Permadonnas again, pixel pushers. But it's, you know, it's their job to create all the art. Yes? No. Simple answer, it's tough. It's really tough to break in because you have to prove that you can carry a game. Um, I would talk to Rawson if you got a chance. Um, it's hard to cross over. Um, and since I'm on the production side, that's kind of where I know best. But um, don't stop trying. 
What I would suggest if you really want to be a good game designer is bring something to the table. Design a, design a level. Use Half-Life. Use an, another system out there and show them why you design the system. Or if you're a writer, write the script, write the dialogue and actually show them. A lot of people, so many people show up to when we have openings and they just hand me a resume. They don't have anything, you know, to show me. Show me that you've been part of a game jam. Show me that you have a demo. Let me see your website. Let me see your art. Let me see your writing. Boom, we're going to hire you like that. Because if you're like, whoa, you, you did that? Yes. How did you do it? Well, I did da, 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 da. Then it's like, wow, you're proving that you can do it. That's the big thing. So many people are just like, I want to be in the game industry. Here's my resume. Have you built a game? No. I like playing them, though. <laughs> That's how I got my wife. <laughs> Uh, marketing, the weasels. Um, that's what we love to call them at, at Microsoft. Um, but it's their job to create the hype for your game. And as we're learning right now in mobile game, we need marketing. We need, we need that hype drawn. Because if 600 gaps are coming out every single day, how are you going to stand out? So you need to do some kind of marketing yourself. Get on social media, tweet, get your web page. Um, go to go to PAX, go to IGDA, you know, show your game there, get a following, get people going with you. Um, because not everyone has uh, a marketing team. So this is unbelievable. So when I worked on uh, Microsoft, we did the f second Halo. The game cost $40 million to develop. We spent $80 million on marketing. But it made, I don't know, enough money. Um, <laughs> so that's the crazy stuff that goes on right now. And how many people are getting sick of Kate Upton on their TV and on their game app? You know, they're spending, that. they cost that, that campaign cost them $80 million. So that little game, mobile game, got to be, it's making right now a million dollars a day. But it's still going to take $80, 80 days just to pay for that campaign. Not all the developers and the artists, everybody working. How am I doing on time? Um, this is a new one, um, uh, especially with mobile, is the UA and data analysts. So how many math people here? All right, because I need you. Um, mathletes, data squirrels, data ninjas. Um, this, their job is to find new ways to attract users to your mobile game or to, I shouldn't say mobile game, because there's in-app purchases and all sorts of games now. but. You know, they track. We have an analytics system in our games right now that we don't know who you are, so don't worry. But I mean, <laughs> we track how many times you're playing and what, and we, we have a bowling game. You know, what bowling ball you use? How many times you use that bowling ball? How many games you played that day? How many strikes you have? How many spares you have? Did you run out of money? Are you out of gold? Oh, ad, you know, free ad, free more. So. We need people to sift through all this data, and you won't believe the amount of data there is and to go through there and help us game developers and studios figure out what's going on. So you don't have to be a programmer. If you love math, you love data, you love games, there's a way for you. Developers, many, 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 many different flavors, code monkeys, bit heads. Um, their job is to code everything. So, and I love this slide. There's so many different, you know, you have your code generalists, your code specialists, your CTO, chief technical officer, people who just do audio, AI, build all the tools. One of the things that BioWare is so, why their games are so good and so deep is because they have a tools team that's unbelievable. They build all these incredible tools that allow their designers to do everything they want. Usually a development lead that's running the team, development manager, runs, manages all of them to make sure they're okay. The coding god. Um, you always have one of those. Uh, multiplay engineer, network engineer, and that really looks like the network engineer that we had in, in uh, Microsoft. That was, that's funny, he was a great guy. Um, other roles, upper management, studio head, um, lawyers, um, group assistants, never, Never, never underappreciate your, your group assistant. They get things done for you. They make sure lots of stuff gets done. Coffee, pizza, everything. Brand managers now to make sure that, you know, if, 
if you come up with a game that has a brand, they keep it going. Um, business development, finding new leads for you. You know, finding that next Pimp My Ride and Dancing with the Stars. Community managers, people who are online that are keeping people excited about your game. We need those people. Once again, they're cheerleaders. Media, many different flavors. Journalists, YouTubers, Twitch people, and most importantly, the players. Um, it, it whipped through really quick, but there's a great movie called Indie. If you haven't seen it, it's on Netflix. You can download it. It's a really great movie also. Grandma's Boy. If you <laughs> that actually, parts of that were filmed at Activision. <laughs> they were inspired by that. Um, and the other one was a book called um, uh, J-Pod. Read the first half. Don't read the second half. First half is about a gaming studio, and they're working on a skateboarding game. And they get a new, new upper management who comes in and says, my kids like the turtles. I want turtles in the game. It's so true. So if you want to really have fun, go look at some of the Cabela games. There's turtles in there. <laughs> so we're hiring um, positions. So where's my math people? We we're looking for a mobile account manager to help us make more money. And also potentially data analysts. Must know math. I don't. Um, so if you're interested, hiring at concretesoftware.com. Um, final thoughts. Okay, it takes all the people that I showed you to make a game. It's not just one person that makes those games. It takes all of them. The other thing is good ideas come from everybody, not the designer. The designer needs help. You know, testers playing a game and can go over and go, you know what, this is fun, but what happens if you did this? And sometimes that this is what makes your game really, really fun. So great ideas come from everywhere. Communicate, please communicate. Don't sit in your office or your cube or whatever. Put your ideas out there. Talk to each other. Work with each other. Create something together. Like I said, if you're trying to get into this industry, create something. Big thing, I check your ego. Don't be a primadonna. Don't be a Richard, if you know what I mean. Don't be a Richard. Um, because to put all those hours in, to work every day together, you want to have fun. You want to be able to communicate. So communicate, bring something to the table. The game comes first, not you. That's, that's my big role. The game comes first. We need to ship this game. Put the game first, not you. Some other stuff, stay active. I've gained 75 pounds since I started working in games. That's a standing desk I built for my son. I have a standing desk at work. One final thought. Original Xbox boys, games are good for kids, okay? This is the original Xbox when it first came out, and magically, it's going to change. Sometimes you love gifts, sometimes you don't. Maybe, maybe not. Eh. Well, it's, if it decides to change, maybe it's because of this crash. But uh, you would show what they look like now. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> So one of the first things when I met my wife was, she goes, I don't want our boys to be nerds. <laughs> that hurt. So, but she learned to play games. She plays games now. We play games together. He's now 24 years old and a graphic designer. Anybody need any work done? I, um, he is actually 20 and is in pre-med at uh, St. John's and also black belt in karate. Trev is now 17 on traveling soccer, also AP and looking into medical. I've seen those kids work together. They learn to read. They learn to problem solve. They learn to work together as a team. So yes, everything in moderation, but games are good. So thank you very much. I have to run for another one. How much time do I have? One minute. Um, questions, maybe in the next one. If you like the art, it's by Andy Rash. I want to give shouts out to him. I never want to steal anything. And when I, as I said, by day I work for Concrete Software. At night I work for Frostbit Studio, which is my own indie studio in Golden Gear Consulting if you need any help. And a lot of times I speak for free because I love to give back. So thank you very much for finding us back here.
And if you do have questions, email me, tweet me, go to my next session. Let's all run down there. And then we can maybe talk afterwards. So thank you.